Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to um, session three, day three of the Spanish uh, Wine Week. Um, and uh, with this, uh, we've got, we're delighted to have uh, next to me here, uh, Mikel Udine, he's a technical director of the uh, Denominación de Origen Protegida at Sierra de Salamanca, which um, uh, will be in its 10th year, I believe, uh, this June. Uh, so celebrations. Uh, hopefully will happen uh, in, in the Sierra. Okay, so I'm going hand, hand to hand you over to uh, Miguel and uh, those of you who have only just joined us, this is your first time on the right, you have a chat, you can post your messages, you can say hello from California or wherever you happen to be. Uh, so, so do post your questions and, and um, We'll be delighted to answer them, or at least Mikhail will be delighted to answer them. Okay, so we're off. I'm going to give you the big screen, Mikhail. Here we go. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh -huh. Do you want your slides? This is the slide. I put, put them for you, yeah? Okay, okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for attending our presentation. I am Miguel Udina, Technical Director at Denominación de Origen Protegida Sierra de Salamanca. First of all, I would like to thank the organization of the Spanish Wine Week for giving us this opportunity to present our wines and promote our Denominación de Origen. I shall start with a brief explanation of its history and characteristics. Okay. What you are looking and here is a prehistoric wine press. Let me, okay, I think it will work. Is it here? This is a prehistoric wine press, uh, the place where our ancestors created the first wines in Sierra. And the structure, as you see, was carved from large granite stones. Here they pressed the, the grapes and they collected the juice, juice over here. Okay. Let me show you another one, maybe it's better. Yes, that one. Oh. Let me, okay. I have to turn it on. Okay, sorry about that. Um, this one in particular is five meters long and by two meters wide. And here is where they pressed the grapes. And here through this hole, they collected the juice over here in this vessel. So this one in particular is more modern than the one in the previous slide, but because you can see these two holes over here, they were supposed to hold an ancient press. So this is kind of the uh, Lagar Rupestre, that's the name we, we use for it, 3.0. And it's um, sometimes you, you can find several iterations of the of this Lagar Rupestre in the same place. Like it's kind of a uh, growing of, of the old wineries. They are located mainly in San Esteban de la Sierra, a town with a population of 200, and they have 100 of these prehistoric wine presses. This is one of the worst sites with the greatest, greatest concentration of these types of construction, and it is difficult to set a date for the construction of these wine presses, but some authors place them in the pre-Roman era. So we are talking over 2,000 years ago um, for the construction of this, the first Lagare Rupestres. If we skip ahead in time, we find the first written references on the quality of the wines from our Sierra in the 12th century. So this time coincides with the area, areas repopulation by the French people traveling from the Burgundy area. Let me, okay, turn off this and I will go on. The production boom, as regards quantity, can be dated between 1930 and 1970 with the creation of a cooperative in each town. What you are seeing here in this picture is an old tank door. From this time on, as happened through Spain, you know, Spain, rural areas were abandoned and there is was exodus to the cities, causing the vineyards to be forsaken. Sorry. This situation started to reverse in the year 2000 with the emergence of, nine, of five new wineries. 
and the creation of Asociación de Viticultores y Elaboradores de Vino de la Sierra de Salamanca. In 2007, along with 30 viticulturists, this association was created and it was clear to both wineries and viticulturists that a denominación de origen protegida had to be created in order to promote the area's wines. So we start to work to achieve in 2010, as Anthony Sen say, the denominación de origen protegida Sierra de Salamanca that was approved in June 2010. As you can see, it is rather a young DOP, a bit preset, but a long history. Just for your information, a part of our region is called Sierra de Francia because of the population by French people I just commented earlier. We opted for the name Sierra de Salamanca for many reasons. It's easier to locate. Our population is really more bigger, more bigger than Sierra de Francia. And last but not least, try to use Francia in a Spanish denominación de origen name. Okay, we move and let me briefly review what makes our wine so special and unique. So we can start with uh, where are we? This is a map uh, of the denominaciones de origen in Spain, and we are in this small plot here. We are located in the west of Spain, we can say the far west, uh, near Portugal, are more or less at Madrid's latitude. So if we zoom a little bit more in here, here we are. We can see that we are far away from our from other wine regions. So in this map, there is no DOP Febreros, but it should be around here, more or less. This is the last denominación de origen from in Castilla León to be approved. And uh, this is in the Gridos region. I think you have you had some some talks about this this region also. And uh, our range of mountains, the Sierra de Bejar is here more or less, and Sierra de Francia is over, over here. And it's a part of, it's followed from Sierra de Gredos, that's here, and then goes on to Sierra de Estrela in Portugal, that's more or less over here. So this is the Sistema Central range of mountains. As you can see, we are far away from the Douro Valley, that the Douro, I the Duero, it's more or less like this. And here you have Arribes, Rueda, and Ribera del Duero, far away from us. And the greatest wine region, that's Cebreros, Mentrida, and Madrid, a part of Mentrida and part of Madrid. It's far away. And also the part, the wine region from Extremadura that are over here in Southern Daraz. We start to see that only from our location, we have to be different than the two other areas. We can zoom a little bit more in. So this is a uh, the, our DOP's village map, we are one of the smallest appellation in Spain with only 500 square kilometers. But as you can see, a lot of small villages, 26 to be precise. We are really, really small and also beautiful. This is a dreamy place, lots of dense forests, high mountains and small plots of vineyards between them. We are in a natural park called Parque Natural de la Sierra de Francia Batuecas, and also we are in a biosphere reserve given by the UNESCO in 2006. The name is Reserva de la Biosfera de las Sierras de Bejar y Francia. But let me focus in what makes our wines special. We can start with uh, climate. The climate is quite different from what we can find in the area of Castilla y León. We have a humid, mild Mediterranean climate which is softer and more modulated than that the one on the plateau. But to me, what's really outstand, outstanding is the quantity of annual rains, because it's around 1,000 liters per year in average, with some places uh, over 1,400 1, liters per year. They concentrate mainly during autumn and spring, and we have dry summers, so we don't have big problems with fungal disease. As you can see, we are a mix between Mediterranean temperatures like North, Northeast Catalonia and the annual rains uh, brings us to more um, Galicia and some parts of Galicia. We also have a large day-night thermal variation which aids the maturation process. Another important part is the soil. This is a 
maps of the soils we can find in our regions. Let me turn the white word on. Okay. We have two kinds of soils. From, we have uh, granitic and slate schist soils. Over here, here, and here, the pink areas are granitic soils. Uh, similar with, um, to the granite we can find in, 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 gredos, in gredos, and it gives normally more elegant and long wines than the other areas. This light area over here in the north of the region is the slate one, and it's similar to the slate you can find in Bierzo or Priorat. And the darker ones, this, this and this one, these three areas, are more schist soils, more similar to the Douros Valley. We will find in all these green areas more uh, clay and more structure and minerality in the wines. There are other areas where the granite and schist or slates are in contact, over here maybe, and over here, and other parts like this also, that we find an interesting kind of soil, Corneana, that according to Universidad de Salamanca, this is the only spot in the world where you can find vineyard on top of this soil. But to me, the real, real, the true treasure of Sierra de Salamanca is its vineyards, planted on terraces in highly steep lands. According to Universidad de Valladolid, this one, these are one of the oldest terraces of Spain. So the vineyards are, are really old. I think Fernando Mora gave you a speech about old vineyards yesterday. Well, we, here we have lots of them. As you can see, the data is impressive. Half of our wines, uh, vines, sorry, are older than 90 years old, and 80% of them have more than 60 years old. So they, they are really, really old. Let me show some more pictures of terraces. These walls over here, have more than two meters. You can guess there is a lot of slope. So to take advantage of the small areas of arable soil, our ancestors planted the vines in a very narrow plantation framework, one and a half meter, but by one and a half meter. This, this gives you, if you have do the, the calculations, 4,000 plants per hectare. You can see maybe better here. These, plant, these vines are separated one and a half meter, meters by one and a half meters. This picture, this, this terrain is also with a highly steep slope, but with the perspective of the picture, it seems flat, but it's, it's also steep. This factor limits production and increases quality. However, it does pose enormous difficulties for agricultural labor, which must be done by hand, everything. This picture is a typical plot of Sierra de Salamanca, terraces, all vines surrounded by forest, and the average surface um, of a plot of vineyard is around half hectare, so really small plots. And we have vineyards from, vineyards from 400 to 1,000 meters above sea level, so high diversity of uh, altitudes here. Almost all the vineyard is in goblet and non-irrigated. So the average production is around 4,000 kilograms per hectare in average. So if you remember our plantation framework gives us 4,000 plants per hectare, the math is simple. We find an average of one kilogram per plant. Apart from this, there was a historical selection of lands leaving the poorest one for vineyards because the good ones were destined to grow vegetables and cereals. Old vines, low yields, Poor soils, I hope you can see a pattern here. Ultimately, we have everything that the books says you need to make good, good wine. But in addition to this, we also have a unique and indigenous variety, the Rufete. Here you can see a picture. This variety is superb for winemaking. The bunch, as you can see here, is small and tightly packed. The, grain, the grains are medium-sized or large and with thin skin. It is a very versatile, fruity and light variety for young wines, which also allows long aging processes with complexity and subtlety. I will show you some more pictures from the harvesting of Rufete and, uh, sorry, bunch of Rufete also. In our region, we can find also Tempranillo and Garnacha. Tempranillo is called Aragonés in our region and Garnacha is called Calabres. 
but the main variety is the Ruffete. If we imagine we were tasting a young wine with 100% Ruffete, we, we would find very little color. Remember, the grape skin is very thin. And in the aromas, we would find a lot of fruit. You might find also licorice, raspberry, and aromatic herbs such as thyme. It is an aromatic wine that gradually evolves inside the glass, and in the mouth, we would find the balanced acidity that's typical of this variety, with a slightly rustic tannin. The wines are longer than white and very pleasant to drink. A vin de soif, as the French say. An aged, an aged truffete wine to the nose would bring fruity and even floral notes, but which are also combined with the oak notes. They are very mineral, subtle and delicate wines. If we taste it in the mouth, we might feel the same lightness as the, in the young ones. They are long, soft wines with very good acidity. Two words that describe to me perfectly our wines are freshness and drinkability. We also have some white grapes, Palomino Fino, Moscatel de Grano Menudo, and Biura, but, uh, sorry, the white grape Rufete Blanco is very promising. It's an ancient variety that was called Verdejo by elderly locals, but during the study carried out to obtain the denominación de origen protegida, we analyzed it genetically and it showed that it is a unique variety in our area and has no relation to Ruedas Verdejo. It's in fact a parental to Rufete, and we choose Rufete Blanco as a vari the variety name. It has very low yields, long vegetative sick cycle, and thick, thick skin, not thin. It boasts very good acidity and good alcoholic degree, and yields singular white wines with a very interesting aromatic profile. Some viticulturists have planted new plots with Rufete Blanco, and you can find some brands now in the market. Here are some pictures of our harvest. This is another typical plot of land at Sierra Salamanca, more or less half hectare surface. And it's quite small and as you can see, surrounded by forest. It has also mixed varieties. So each plot must be harvested three times, at least more if you want to har harvest some white grapes. Harvesting is done manually, as you can see here. We start usually in the first week of September with the Rufete and following Tempranillo, Garnacha, and then Rufete Blanca. As you can see in this picture, uh, the harvesting is done in small boxes and it takes around one month for us to harvest 300,000 kilograms of grapes. Some more pictures, this one of old people in an old vineyard. And moving to the wineries, uh, right now we have nine wineries in the Nominación de Origen Protegida Sierra de Salamanca, all of them small. They produce small quantities of high quality wine, most of them own their, their vineyard and are fam family driven sellers. We have also some interesting winemakers from other Spain's places like Rioja, Madrid, several others. They are making their own brands, renting a, a small space, uh, sorry, a small space in some of the nine wineries. Also, we produce less wine in other regions than um, in a medium-sized uh, winery of Rioja. We are present, we, we are present in many parts of the world. Near 50% of our production goes to the USA, Northern Europe, and Asia. The rest is sold locally, mainly, mainly locally, also in Salamanca and Madrid. In 2020, we expect, well, we were, we were expecting to sell 200,000 bottles with around 30, more or less 30 brands in the market. You can do the calculations. The high quality production are very limited and done with great care. We are proud to have achieved such great acceptance from critics and consumers in, short, in such a short period of time. We have very good ratings. And when I say good, I mean really good. Our Denominación de Origen has the second best rating in the Peñin Guide with a 91 point average. And Wine Advocate rated us several wines above 90 points. Here you can, you can read what Luis Gutierrez said about the Rufete and our wines. Uh, as you know, Luis Gutierrez is the wine advocate taster for our region. I for Spain, sorry. Sierra de Salamanca is perhaps one of the smaller and younger appellations that seems more active. 
The delicate Profete grape is able to produce bright ruby colored wines with floral aroma and fresh palate that very much fit the mold of what many consumers are looking for, drinkability and personality. And I agree with him. So I hope you had a glimpse of our region. I invite you to taste some of our wines. They will surely surprise you. And of course, we invite you to travel and discover in a near future, not right now, to Sierra de Salamanca. Thanks a lot. And if you have any questions, I will try to answer right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikhail. Very mm -hmm. informative. Let's just um, take the slides off. Mm -hmm. uh, there we are. Uh, and so, people listening, any, any questions? Uh, if there are any coming, uh, please post them now. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one. R the Ruffetti Blanco. Yes. Uh, are any of the uh, nine producers in the uh, region uh, making sparkling wine that variety? No, not with Ruffetti Blanco, but they are making sparkling wine with Ruffetti, Ruffetti Tinto. There are mm, two producers producing sparkling wine with Ruffetti, but in really small quantities and are kind of a test. Not well, in the denomination the region, but because it's not allowed. Well, traditional method or...? or yes, well, there is an, an ancestral and, and a champenoise method. Right. So the results are quite promising. With the Ruffetta Blanco, the problem, maybe it's that the skin is really thick and you need about three kilograms of grapes to, to achieve a liter of, of wine. So it's, it's difficult to press and maybe for sparkling wines. It has a little bit of tannin also, maybe it's not the, the best variety. But it's a, for white wines and white wines with uh, aging in barrel, it's a very good variety. Right. So Ken is asking, is the Ruffetti often blended with other grape varieties? Well, um, yes, you have everything from monovarietals from Ruffetti. Uh, to blends with uh, with Tempranillo and Garnacha, the other two, two varieties you can find here. You can find also some Rufete in, in some Rufete in Portugal, and they blend it, and in Arribes del Duero, but there are really, really small quantities of Rufete there. Uh, in the vineyards, the plantation are mixed, so you find the, the Rufete along with Tempranillo, Garnacha, some other varieties, uh, some of which we are to you know what what they are, and with the white varieties also, and usually the wineries started to mix it, but we have seen that the market is demanding Ruffetti alone, and the results are better if the Ruffetti is alone. It's, it gives really elegant, really easy to drink wines, and it's working very well, very well. I okay, so it's Ken's question and. Um... You, you say that the uh, Ruffetti is indigenous to the Sierra de Salamanca, but you also say that it's uh, growing in Portugal. Is it indigenous there, or, or did they uh, take it and plant it? <laughs> the, I think there is no variety indigenous to one region only. No? There is always uh, some trade between varieties. We think the origin of Ruffetti, but it's, it's, it's really, really difficult to say that, but we think it, it came with the people from Burgundy that came in the 12th century and gave name to the to our region, Sierra de Francia. And I say that because it kind, the, the wines of made with Ruffete, they have some similarity with the Gamés in Morgon of Fleury, the, the, the cruise of uh, Beaujolais. And some people say they also have some similar similarities with uh, Pinot Noir. And I have, I've read some I've read some studies that says that mostly all the indigenous grapes of Castilla León, like Mencia in El Bierzo and other north regions of Castilla León, Prieto Picudo in León, or Juan García in Arribes, and also Rufete, came from France by the Camino de Santiago, and they adapted to the, the to the terroir but it's really difficult to say it I, another another possibility that it came from portugal but to me it's more i think that the french theory it, it's better for understanding okay just got a hello there from guatemala 
<laughs> okay, so um, thank you very much for that. Very interesting. Uh, next up, we've got live interviews with wine producers from uh, Bodegas Belga Alfaro, the Uchel Riqueda, Hacienda del Tenero, Rioja, and Baldova down in Valencia. So um, there's the link, live link. If you want to join the uh, next session, just click on there. And uh, I don't know if, I think if people want to contact you, are, are you able to put your email address? Yes, of course. I will. Do you want I to type it in? And, uh, if somebody wants to more information, uh, yeah. or have any questions, I would. Perfect. Yes, and in our website, you can you can download uh, uh, all this information and more. Thanks a lot. Great. Thanks very much. So uh, we'll see you all in the next session. Thank, Thank you, Miguel. Thank you. Bye. Bye.